Shalom Chavrim, in a world of Ein Shalom, I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. This evening's broadcast is not going to be an easy one. Uh, as the title of the broadcast states there, Prime Minister Netanyahu has set the stage for the coming of the two witnesses. And I think it's time, friends, that we need to do some soul searching. There are some that come to our channel that say that, Steve, you've changed. You don't support Israel like you used to support Israel. And that can be nothing further from the truth than you could ever imagine. But what has happened, and I will agree with you, is that God has been revealing more and more to me about what is going on biblically and prophetically that is setting this stage. The image in behind you from February 2016 is an image from the Knesset where Prime Minister Netanyahu actually made it a point to be a part of the Gay Pride Day in Israel. He wanted to be there. Now, what you can see from the image right here, of course, though, is the fact that the Israeli flags, barely to be able to be seen, is overshadowed by that of the gay pride flag. And let me state right off, I am not here to attack the gay people or gay community. What they have chosen in life is strictly up to them. But when it comes to Jerusalem, when it comes to the land of Israel, when it comes to the people that support Israel and those that stand behind the Israeli people and the coming of the Mashiach, coming of the Messiah, I do have to make a stand there because biblically the stage is being set for the two witnesses. And one of those signs of setting that stage was, of course, the prophecy that we find over in Revelation chapter 11 of the coming of the two witnesses, in particular at the end of the ministry of the two witnesses, when their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which, by the way, is Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. And we know that Yeshua himself, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was crucified in Jerusalem. How did it get the name spiritually of Sodom and Egypt? And who caused this to happen? Well, we're going to explore that. And of course, it is information I've shared with you many times before. But I think that as you begin to see this and begin to look not only at the events that have been happening over in Israel and even more recently, maybe you might come to understand better why I make the stand that I do. I must stand with Jesus Christ. I must stand with Yeshua the Messiah. I must stand with Israel, the true Israeli people that have returned to this land in order to see the coming of the Messiah. Granted, it's the house of Judah first. The house of Israel has yet to come home. And sadly enough, I am reminded when I see such images as this one here in 2016, and I did not even know this it even existed. I had never seen this before. I knew the prime minister said that he supported the gay pride parade in Jerusalem. I knew from uh, Saman Tov, who we had on before, which I'll share a clip this evening with you, that the prime minister of Israel uh, had paid the gay community and guaranteed their safety and wanted to have the parade there in Jerusalem to show his solidarity with the community. Now, I will agree with the Prime Minister. I don't uh, believe in the terrorism and the hatred towards the gay community. But then again, they're not interested in my way of thinking and believing, and they leave me be, and as well, we should be the same to them. But when it comes to the holiest city on the planet Earth, and we say nothing, you take no side, have you ever thought about the very words of Jesus Christ when he says that the blind, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch? Do you have any co conception truly of what this means? You see, Israel, we know, was blinded in part, as Paul said in Corinthians, no, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 11, that the Gentiles might have sight. They were blinded for your sake, 
They were blinded so that Messiah could be offered up as a sacrifice for the perpetuation for my sins, your sins. But according to Revelation, John writes in there when he speaks about Laodicea, that the Laodicean church, which is the church of today, that they are blind, naked, miserable, wretched, and you don't even know it. So here we have the evangelical community that is too blind to recognize that Rome is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It doesn't mean that Catholic people are all bad. All right. I'm not here to bash Catholic people because God says that he has his children in there and he says, come out of her in Revelation 18, 4 and be not partakers of her sins. So he's got children in there that need coming out. And I think that does apply to Israel more specifically, but as well, even Gentiles, they have no idea. Why? Because they're they're in a blind organization. And that blind organization is trying to lead Israel. And of course, the evangelical community under the leadership of Kenneth Copeland has, it's the blind leading the blind. And of course, the blind Christian of Laodicea is trying to lead Israel, whose also eyes are blind and can't see. And they're going to fall in a ditch unless God sends someone that will help get Israel to wake up to who she is. And of course, my desire is to wake you up as well. I know many of you, I mean, thousands of you know the truth and you realize that you persevere with me and I appreciate that and I love you. And you have to understand, I'm not here to ball you out at all, you know, but we have some that, and I love them just as much. I love them and care for them, but I see you being swayed away by those propagandists that are Jesuits that are supporting them, you know, the, uh, what is it, uh, an agenda of murder? You know, yes, Israel has a right to defend herself. I agree with that. And don't you think that God will fight for his remnant? Don't you remember when Peter chops the ear off of the, of the high priest's uh, guard there that Jesus tells him, put away his sword? Don't you know, he says that if I needed 10 legions of angels, I would call my father now and he would straightway deliver them to me. Don't you know that Jude knew what Jesus meant when he wrote in his one chapter book and he says, quoting Enoch, that the Lord will come at the end of the days with 10,000s of his saints. There's those 10 legions of angels. Exactly what he says. And yeah, yeah, Jude quoted from Enoch. Wow, gosh, uh, why don't we just take and hang Jude then, right? Because he quotes from Enoch. Come on. I, I'm trying to get you guys to wake up. We're in a serious hour, serious hour. Stand with Israel. But let me tell you something. Even the Arabic people in Syria, I don't know about Iran. I know there are people in Iran that also love Israel. They love the Jewish people, but they don't support the, the government of Israel that is sitting there trying to lead the entire world to a new world order. Jerusalem is going to become an international city, thanks to people like Prime Minister Netanyahu and others. But there are some in the Israeli government that are not for this. Now, let's get into this. Let's get started. As I said here, and it's funny how that you, Google wants to make sure this, this image pops off the screen frequently, isn't it? All right. Now, I said they set the stage. Let's look at the stage that the government of Israel has set for us. And then you, you answer me, is this what you really support? Can we support the spirit of Barabbas, for example? When Jesus came, he came as a peace. He, according to Isaiah 61, he came that way in peace, but he also says he will come back when the time of vengeance is. But that's his. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know, Jesus said, let the weeds grow with the tares. Don't try to uproot them. You'll take up the wheat while you're doing it. And I can see why, because the weeds are out there choking the death, the true wheat of God, choking you with your, with their lies and spew of propaganda and ungodliness. 
Jeez. I know some of you probably get upset. Steve, don't shout, don't scream. All right. Listen, this is very serious, and I'm sorry. I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I've got, I've got, you know, I've got to stand before God one day, give an account for what I've told you. And yes, I could sit there and lie to you, and and I could go out there and tell you, oh, everything's all hunky dory, and praise God, and Israel's taken and killing, and we're going to drive the Palestinians out, and we're going to drive the Syrians out, and we're going to destroy Iran, you know, and oh, people would probably just shower me with thousands of dollars, and praise God, brother. And you want me to lie like that? I will not. I will stand on the word of God. You know, and those that are, are, are Jewish, that are supposed to be believers in Yeshua and don't know any better than to tell you such nonsense. Understand, if you, I love you, if you want to make a comment and it's not, in a, you know, you differ with me, I have no problem with that. If you're going to troll the channel, we have moderators, and I love these moderators. They're blessed people there. But if you're going to troll the channel and try to get people to go over to somebody that tells you that the wolf that's coming is perfectly okay and not to worry about the wolf, the wolf won't hurt you. I will delete the video, delete the comment. And if it's going to be a troll to continue on to try to get people as a shepherd, I am responsible for the sheep. I will block the person from the channel. I'm telling you straight up. You know, people have a free right to go listen to anybody they want. And if you don't believe what I'm telling you, then I, you know, then by all means, I pray for you. I love you. I'm your brother. I'll do anything I can to help you. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay. Now, uh, as we move on, let's look at this. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. This is about the two witnesses. They come, they, according to the scripture, they come at a time of the building of the third temple, no less. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave it out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Three and a half years, friends. Three and a half years. They're going to take what? The holy city. The Gentiles will. And this is part of what the two-state solution or even the regional solution that they're trying to make now, that's what it's all about. The old city of Jerusalem is to be internationalized. The United Nations is to be put there to control that and the Vatican will have hegemony over that. All right? Now, let's look at how I said here. Uh, we know that the two witnesses come. I will give power to my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two th two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks and there and before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. This is when God's judgment begins to fall upon the earth is through these two here. This is where we see in Micah, where I shared with you Micah chapter seven, where this one man comes with a rod, not a rod, a stick running around like some of these people that claim that they're Moses or, or, or whoever they think that they are and they're saying that they turned the water to blood and they're doing this and they're doing that. No. You know why God turns the water to blood under Moses? He does that for one reason, because of the blood shed on the earth, because of the blood of the aborted babies, because of the blood of the murders that are going on in Syria. And yes, Syria. Yes, Syria. You know, I shared with you guys over and over and over and over. Isaiah 17, God shows that Damascus falls, but he also says that the fortress of Ephraim is taken away because of Damascus being destroyed. Yes, Damascus is taken away from being a city. And then God says in verse 10 that you do this because you have forgotten the God. Let, let, let's pull it up real quick. I, I, don't want to just, I don't want to just paraphrase it. You need to hear that once again. We know Damascus will be taken away from being a city. All right, chapter 17, we see that. 
Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. All right? We know that the fortress, in verse 3, shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Aram shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall come to pass in that day that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. Why? Because when you go to killing off everybody in Damascus, there's going to be a retaliation. And not only is this happening to the Syrians, which Aram is Syria, not only is it going to happen to them that they go into exile like you went into exile on several occasions because of our sins, as Jeremiah forewarned and all the other prophets said that this would happen to us, including Moses, but also Israel once again will wax lean. Jacob, not just the tribes of Israel there in the Middle East, either the three, the house of Judah, but all of Israel will wax lean. In other words, we may have bombs dropping on Europe and on the United States as well as a result of our are destroying of Damascus okay now when we get down to verse 10 God says here for thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strong fort therefore did you plant pl plants of pleasantness and this set it with slips of a stranger God didn't want you bringing Rome back in now he knew you would do it yes it is prophecy when Jesus left, Rome was in control. When Jesus was here, Rome was the one that condemned him. And, and, and it was Rome that actually did the dirty work of crucifying him. But it was, of course, my own people that handed him over to the, to the Roman authorities at that time to have him killed. Pilate wanted to release him. It's kind of interesting, though. Pilate said he wanted to, you know, he said, says, says to Jesus, don't you know that I have power to crucify you or I have power to set you free? And Jesus says, you had no power at all except it were given to you from above. I've wondered about that. What did Jesus really mean when he said that? I used to always think that that was speaking of God granting him this power. And maybe that's what it is. But I've wondered some other things as well. At any rate, though, as I said, they have set the stage for the coming of the two witnesses, the Likud party. Prime Minister Netanyahu, Shimon Perez was really the father of the mastermind behind this. But Prime Minister Netanyahu certainly has definitely help make the stage to be set because he's the one that brought the sodomite situation there. Let's notice here, Arut Shiva. This is an article back from um, uh, May 12th, 2014. Protests erupt over King David's tomb deal. You guys know it. I've told you about this already. It says here, hundreds of religious Jews gathered Monday near the reputed scene of Jesus' last supper in Jerusalem, demanding that Israel keep sovereignty over King David's tomb, according to the AFP. Pope Francis will visit the Holy Land from May 24th to the 26th and before returning to Rome is set to hold a mass in the site known as the Upper Room of the Cynical on Mount Zion near the walls of the Old City. Jews revere the site as the tomb of King David which is on the ground floor of the same building. All right. As soon as they touch the status quo of this place, bad things will happen, said Rabbi Avraham Goldstein, accusing the Israeli government of wanting to hand the upper room over to the Vatican. Now, he was right. Now, they denied it. They denied it. They said that's not true. All right. But oddly enough, on this was actually like two weeks before that, Netanyahu asked rabbi to allow giving David's tomb to the Vatican. What? By the way, on the picture here, right here, this is Moshe Faglin. He is one of the only decent politicians in Israel. And in fact, Netanyahu pulled a little shenanigan in the last election to make sure that he could not uh, overthrow Netanyahu in the polls. Yeah. You remember when Obama went to Israel to try to make sure that Netanyahu didn't get reelected? I think it was the other way around. I think they wanted to make sure Netanyahu stayed in power. After all, they all work for the Pope. Hmm. At any rate, it says here, a Knesset member said Thursday that Chief Sephardic Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef told him that the Prime Minister's Bureau contacted him and asked him to grant Halak 
permission for Israel to hand over the tomb of David to the Vatican. The startling news was revealed by the Knesset member during a tour of the tomb of David by four MKs, Yanni Chetboen and the Jewish home who initiated the tour, Moshe Feiglin, Lakud Betanei, and Nassim Zaev Shash and the Mir Paush of the United Torah of Judaism. Oh, wow. Netanyahu, did you catch that? I'm sorry, I'm supposed to stand with Netanyahu and all the evils that he is doing in the, in, the, in the country. Not only has he taken and turned the city of Jerusalem into Sodom, spiritually speaking, but he is also now willing to hand over Mount Zion to the Vatican. If you hand it over to the Vatican, you in essence are handing the, 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 the Mount Zion over to the spiritual Egyptians. And to save time, just so you know what I'm talking about, Hadad was the sole surviving heir of the sword of David and Saul that was wiping out Esau's children, according to the biblical canon in the book of Kings, I believe it is. And he, he escapes down into Egypt. He is raised by the Pharaoh as his own son, kind of like that of the story of Moses. When he becomes of age, he's a little boy at the time, what happens? He gives him his wife's sister to marry. Well, now his children are all going to be Egyptians, that's for sure. Half, half descendant of Abraham, half uh, um, Egyptians. Kind of like that of Joshua, uh, excuse me, Joseph, when Joseph married Asenath. But there are conflicting reports in another, uh, I think it's in the, uh, the book of Jesha, where, uh, where it actually says that she was not Egyptian, she was actually an Israelite. Don't know. Who knows? That's just a conjecture there. But let me just say this to you here. What's interesting is that Hadad, when he does become of age and he gets to the point, he gets married and stuff, he, want, he hears that David is dead and wants to return to his own land. He doesn't go to his own land of where Esau's descendants were. Instead, he goes to Syria. He becomes the king of Syria. Later, Obadiah tracks his descendants up into Rome and says that Titus, the Roman general that sacked the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, was in fact an Edomite from the Esau clan, the tribe of Esau, which of course was half Egyptian and half, of course, uh, Esau's descendants. Makes sense in why we have all the artifacts of Egypt at the Vatican. And it makes sense why that the Vatican worships the sun god. It makes sense why the Vatican has the huge obelisk out front where the Pope himself, not the current Pope, but many years back, had it moved there. And it's also kind of interesting to me that not only that, the Vatican's Roman soldiers are pretty obvious who they are because they each one seem to also host an Egyptian obelisk from Egypt in their cities, such as France, in Paris, and England, right there in the heart of England. They have their own Egyptian obelisk. And of course, the United States in New York City, not to mention the one in Washington, but the one in Washington is not from Egypt. But those three cities there, all like the Vatican, host a, a true Egyptian obelisk. Not to say that other countries don't have obelisks, but sure they do. I'm sure that Russia has it as well. But when it comes to obelisks that are directly from Egypt, those cities are all connected. And isn't it kind of odd that they're the ones that form the coalition to go and bomb Bashar al-Assad? For crimes that he's accused of, that we have proven clearly without any doubt, that he is not guilty of gassing his own people. But we have shown clearly where the CIA worked with the Turkish President Erdogan smuggling the sarin gas into the country and Aaron Erdogan, the MP member of the Turkish government, exposing Erdogan and others in his government complicit with smuggling sarin gas with ISIS into Syria arming and killing the Syrian people and said that the blood of the children of Syria were on the hands of the Turkish government. What do you know?
And we're supposed to stand with this. When God says you have forgotten the God of your salvation, he says you have forgotten the rock of your stronghold, which is Jesus Christ. Not to say that God doesn't forgive and that he won't forgive. And the same with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Not that we cannot pray for this man and for his administration that God will open their eyes because they are blind. And what's worse though is that the evangelical community, God says, are blind, miserable, and wretched, and naked, and don't even know it, and you're trying to lead Israel. What a mess. So anyway... They decide to put the Pope of Rome there, right? So you bring that down. Now also notice here, another interesting little tidbit here is this man picture with Pope Francis. This was on June the 6th, 2013, so about six months before some of these things really became known and before we've seen Netanyahu reaching out to the rabbi to get the blessing to hand over the Mount Zion to the Pope of Rome. And by the way, I've been there to try to interview him. He would do an interview originally. He won't do it now because he's scared to death. And they replaced the placards there. You know, now this Mount Zion area is called now the World Peace Center. Never was that before. Not to my knowledge anyway. Maybe I'm wrong, but they all have all new placards. If you ever go there and look, notice they're much smaller than the original ones that were there. But I never paid attention to the name of it originally. But now it's called the World Peace Center. Hmm, sounds like a new world order to me, doesn't it to you? Anyway, the Times of Israel reported, Deputy Foreign Minister in Rome says agreement could be signed this year. Holy See to receive permission for two new churches. Not just that. Deputy Foreign Minister Zev Elkin was in Rome for high-level negotiations with the Vatican. Officials over several outstanding land and building issues revolving around properties owned by the Holy See in Israel. Elkin visited the Holy See to continue decades-long talks on a comprehensive land deal between Israel and the Vatican, Marev reported on Thursday. Elkin told the Hebrew Daily, after meeting with the Vatican negotiating team, then separately with Pope Francis, he thought an agreement would be signed by the end of the year, which would pave the way for the new Pope's promised visit to the Holy Land. Elkin's meetings Wednesday were the first such negotiations in two years. And I'm supposed to support the Likud party, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and those in his government, that are handing over Mount Zion to the Vatican, an Egyptian entity, so that we can set the stage for the killing of the two witnesses. All right? Now, the end of the year comes, December 2nd, 2013, Netanyahu gives Pope his late father's book on the Inquisition. In the first sit-down, Francis and Israeli Prime Minister discuss peace talks with Palestinians. Pontiff voices hope for lasting peace. Oh yeah, he's smiling big, not because of the book, but because they had signed over the Vatican and they got the property on Mount Zion. Giulio Miotti noted in one of his own articles, there was no referendum. The people had no say. And you know what the proof is? The proof is in the eating of the pudding, right? What happened in the tomb of David? First, the Pope comes and he actually does have his little sit down, his communion service there with a select group of men there in the upper room above King David's tomb. The following week, they came again, but it wasn't this time the Vatican, it was the Greek Orthodox. They got to have their communion service, and then they come again. This time, they throw the Jews out of David's tomb. One woman, as she was being escorted out, said, whispered to the security guy that was throwing them out, and she says, is this so that the Catholic Church can do a communion? And he whispers under his breath, yes. Hmm. If the Vatican didn't have control over it, they couldn't throw the Jews out, could they? And this is what we're supposed to support. Now you might say, oh no, Brother Steve, it's not that. It's the fact that, you know, of Iran and it's uh, the, of Syria and it's of uh, the Palestinians. We'll get into that in just a moment. All right? I do support Israel's right to defend herself. But I also know the God of Israel will defend the true Israel. But... Are you standing for a new world order? 
Or are you standing for the true Israelis? Okay, and let me share with you, John Kerry, when he was doing his nine-month negotiation, I've shared that with you so many times. Yeah, he was doing the nine-month negotiations. It wasn't for the sake of the Palestinian people. And my Palestinian people, friends, that you might be listening here now, you were only duped by Rome. And yes, those of you that are going to the front lines and protests are going there as Cardinal Louis Jean Theron of who's the head of the religious dialogue for the Vatican there over the with the with the, for the Vatican and Israel. He's the one that stated back in 2011 there will be no peace in Jerusalem until the status of all the holy sites is adequately resolved. Oh, he made good on his promise because then it wasn't long. The WikiLeaks email proved that Hillary Clinton was given the email by two of her aides that suggested that she go and stir up unrest with the Palestinians. That was only within a week. A week of Cardinal Tehran's statement. Tell me who runs the show then. Oh, they say peace, peace. Jesus said when they say peace and safety, don't believe it. Right? I may have quoted wrong who actually stated that, but you know what I'm speaking about. So John Kerry's nine-month negotiation did not fail. It actually worked. Yeah. It worked because not only did the, the, the Prime Minister of Israel go and meet with the Pope uh, of Rome, but also we had Tony Palmer who played the part of Elijah out of his own mouth, he states this. And he went to Kenneth Copeland, the evangelical community, to make sure that they rallied the evangelical community in behind the Pope of Rome. And many of them, many of the evangelical community has done it, and they have brought the children of, the, uh, of Israel. I say the children of Israel. I'm talking about the ten tribes that are parts of these churches that are believers in Jesus that are going out there believing such nonsense and backing the Vatican's agenda for a new world order. Oh, they don't call it a new world order. As John Hagee stated, he says, I didn't understand in his letter that the Vatican played such a significant role here in the last days, and he apologized for the things that he said, calling that the Vatican was the Roman Catholic whore of revelation. I wouldn't apologize for it, John. Oh, but you did get to be part of the embassy move, right? And that's another thing. People get upset. Oh, Steve, I can't believe you're, you're upset. You know, you say you, you're for the embassy. Yeah, it's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the holiest city on the earth. Embassy should be there. Not just the American embassy. All the embassies should be there. It should be the capital of Israel. But do you really think that the Israelis are getting all of Jerusalem and that the Palestinians are getting nothing? And I'm not begrudging of the Palestinian people. I think it should be one state. And it should not be an apartheid state. It should be a state where both Palestinians and Jews can live in peace together. Okay? So Kenneth Copeland helped set the stage. That's what allowed the Pope of Rome to fulfill what this image here shows right here. And let me make sure it's big enough for you to be able to see. All right? Whoop. Yeah, they're not going to let me do it, are they? Ah, I don't know what this Italian statement is here. I have no idea what it says, but let's go back to the picture here so you can see Pope Francis there in the upper room wearing his crown in May of 2014, fulfilling biblical prophecy of Obadiah, as I've said to you many times, whereas you have drunk upon my holy mouth, and so shall you shall all the nations drink continually, yea, they shall drink and shall swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. So not only did Rome come and drink on the holy mountain of God, which is Mount Zion, according to verse 17, but also the Gentiles, the Greek Orthodox, and the other churches continued to drink upon God's holy mountain. And of course it was Esau, exactly as the scripture prophesied. And speaking of that, now we had also the children of Israel were out there, as I brought up to you earlier here in the broadcast, they were protesting, they were crying out, the house of Judah was, and saying, don't let the Pope come here, don't give up Mount Zion. You know, but remember what Samuel the prophet said to you? He tells you about the king. You know, you rejected your king. 
What's interesting is God gave a secondary method for the king, and that was a prophet. And that happened when God, God himself wanted to come down. He wanted to have a personal relationship with Israel. He was willing to do it, not just to talk to Moses only. He comes down. The trumpet did blast long. The fire, the, 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 was, uh, the, the mountain smoked and everything. And the people were so afraid. They said, let not God speak lest we die, but only Moses. And everybody's talking about they're waiting for the last trump. And yet during the times of Israel in the wilderness journey, when the trumpet did blow then, everybody was scared to death and cried out for Moses only to speak. And then God made the statement to Moses. He says to, to him, I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren, liken unto me. That's what Moses says, liken unto him. And he, said, All, he says, those that do not hear him, they will be cut off. Yeshua himself, Jesus of Nazareth, was that prophet. And oddly enough, when Jesus does come, he actually says to the Israelites of that day, the house of Judah that was there, he said, I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. But another will come in his name, him you will receive. And he says, how can you believe when you have honor of one of another? And when Donald Trump came, and he moved, just moving the embassy to Jerusalem, they name everything after him. He becomes the great hero of Israel. But when the true man of God, the true holy one of Israel, when the Mashiach, the Messiah himself came 2,000 years ago, you didn't name a street in his name. The only one that did anything was other than his apostles that believed upon him and preserved his words was the fact that they took and, the, and, and Pilate writes on him, uh, Jesus, or Yeshua, King of the Jews. Oh, they got, you got angry over that. The only sign attributed to him was put on a cross. But they'll name a soccer club and a, and, a, and a circle after Donald Trump. Just like Jesus said, another will come in his own name and you'll receive him. You know, interesting. Well, what spirit are we of? Are we of the Barabbas spirit? Because Pilate did give the option back then, 2,000 years ago. Would you rather you have, you know, Barabbas? I, I'll, I'll release either one. I'll give you Jesus. If you want Jesus, I'll give you Jesus. They said, no, wait with him. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. We want Barabbas. Set Barabbas in here. And instead, they got a murdering spirit. That spirit is still alive and well. And I see it all over the world. You know, God even says, I think it's written in Jude, Jude says that until that generation of warriors died off, they came out of Egypt with the children of Israel, they couldn't enter the promised land. That applies to the day as well. We won't enter the promised land until the bloodshed ceases. And the thing is, it'd be different if a man was defending himself or if Israel was defending himself. But it's not the way it started off. Yeah, Israel ends up having to defend itself eventually because of so much provocations. And the provocations is coming from the very ones that have created the Sodom and Egypt atmosphere so that when the two witnesses come, the scripture can be fulfilled. Spiritually, they're called Sodom and Egypt. Interesting, isn't it? Now, moving back on here. So Kenneth Copeland did what he did. The Vatican did what they did. They fulfilled the scripture. And then what do we have now? Also, Prime Minister Netanyahu, as I shared with you before, January 6, 2014, the article comes out the Times of Israel. Israel's abortion law now among the world's most liberal. Again, remember, it's a Barabbas spirit. The rejection of Yeshua an acceptance of a killing spirit. No wonder why Moses will turn the water to blood. Also again, Mr. Aiken appear, or Elkin appears, Zev Elkin appears in the news once again in 2017, proposes separate council to manage Jerusalem Arab neighborhoods. 
A new bill being pushed by Minister of Jerusalem Affairs, Zev Elkin, will see Arab towns in the city located beyond the separation barrier removed from the city's jurisdiction and managed by separate local council. Now, as he goes on to try to say, I'm not trying to divide Jerusalem. No, you're just setting up the stage for Rome, for the New World Order, that's all. So you want to kind of play it down. No one is dividing Jerusalem, Elk and Stress, in an interview with Ynet News on Sunday. I propose a move that won't undermine the sovereign status of the territory as opposed to other plans I believe are suicidal. Okay, that's fine. So you say it, sounds great and everything, but as Donald Trump even said when he moved to Jerusalem, to, uh, to Jerusalem and he said Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, yet his verbiage of the status quo of the Temple Mount will remain the same and of course this will not affect a negotiation between Israel and of course the Palestinians that will still be decided later yeah East Jerusalem you're all the little coup parties are they're already getting everything ready get it ready hand it all over make ready for the new world order is this what we stand for you know let me, let me go back and remind you of something that Saman Tov said. Let me just take you. I want to show you some of the things that are being done because you may not be aware of it. I want to go to 15 minutes and 30 seconds in the video here. And this is where Prime Minister Netanyahu was taking land that little old ladies had been buying in Israel for the longest time and they give it over. The Prime Minister gave it over to the Palestinian Authority. And again, I'm not for dividing up the land. Listen to what he says. Hey, Jeremy Sando. I got to get past. I guess we were too long out on the video here, so we have to get beyond the uh, commercial here. What's your thoughts on that right there? I know there's been several ideas that have been floated in the media. Because there's no question, there has been a mass, I don't want to be called brainwashing, but through media, in, in mass, they've been implanting the concept of a, a Palestinian entity for years, for many years. And, and the truth is, is, you know, some of the land that Jews contributed money into the Israel National Fund for years and years. We're talking little old ladies that had next to nothing but had a vision and a, and a dream that one day Israel would be reestablished. They put money into this fund and they used mo that money to buy land for the last hundred years. And that land has been under government jurisdiction. And they call it Area C. And they, Benjamin Netanyahu has been surrendering great big blocks of that land over and over to the so-called Palestinians for them to build new cities and new villages and new now This is all being done while there's a freeze for Israelis on building. All right. Now, what he's talking about of course, it was published right here on Netanyahu's legacy as a Palestine state in Area C. This came out on June 16, 2017. Okay. The Secretary General of the National Union Party, Ofer Sofer, on Thursday criticized Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over the plan to build 14,000 housing units in Kalkalia at the expense of Area C. In the years when Obama served as president of the supposed free world, we had to live in the construction freeze. But now that there is a new president, and it's inconceivable that the freeze is not only continuing, but Land belonging to the state of Israel is handed out to the Palestinians, said Sofer. He's talking about President Trump. In other words, President Trump is seemingly to do everything that seems to be so wonderful in support of the Jewish people, but at the same time, while Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, is taking the very land that was purchased. Nobody living on the land. The land has been purchased, but the Israeli government has controlled that land and not allowed it to go to any of the people that purchased the land and instead just gave it over to the uh, Palestinian Authority. Where's the justice? Well, so long as we get an embassy in Jerusalem on a property that the U.S. already owns anyway, adjacent to the Catholic Church. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? That Roman agenda. Interesting. 
Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with the nether world are we in agreement. When the scouring scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood have we hid ourselves. That scripture right there was quoted in the same video by Simon Tov. He said that the Lord revealed to him that the Israeli government, that one day the Lord spoke to him recently, and he wrote an article about it, saying that the Israeli government, the current administration, had made a covenant with death and hell. Watch what it says, verse 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, the ballad mongers of this people, which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant, barit et mot, a covenant with death. And whether the nether world are we in agreement. In agreement with the nether world. He made a covenant with death. Is this why we're willing to just kill all of our neighbors? Have we forgotten? As God says, we've forgotten the God of Israel, so we know it's true. We've forgotten that the mothers, all four of the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel are all Syrians. They're ancestors. You know, I could understand if Bashar al-Assad had attacked Israel begin to lob rockets into Israel and attack Israel. That would be one thing. But they didn't. And in 2011, was trying to make peace with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And he wouldn't do it. He even said that he wanted to work with Hamas and get them to also recognize Israel's right to exist. But Israel would have no part of that. Not the Israeli people. I'm sure they would have embraced the peace because many Israelis just want peace. Many of them want to see the coming of the Messiah. Some of them, I realize, don't care, but many of them do. But that wasn't to be had. And so we come to the situation here, the more recent situation in Gaza. And I realize, as I state, I show you both sides of the story. I know that the protests have gotten out of hand. I know that protesters have broken through the security fence and it has put Israeli lives at risk. But how did it start? All right, that's something we have to ask ourselves. How did this start to begin with? And this is what's sad. You know, the Israeli government is trying to justify to us that they were killing terrorists. And after all, Hamas was actually created by the Mossad as a controlled opposition. But Hamas has gotten completely out of control. They were dealing, doing this in order to try to deal with Yasser Arafat when he was in power. But now they can't control, they can't even control it anymore. And yes, Hamas is bent on doing terror in Israel. I agree with that. And they use these civilians to instigate things on the border. But Israel didn't help matters none either. And it wasn't just terrorists, as we have been led to believe, that was a part of this. It is also, it is also, were doctors that were shot, paramedics that were shot, journalists that were shot, and this was before, before, we got into the tire burning and the Molotov cocktails and all that that got, that got everything that got completely out of control. I want you to listen to this doctor, Canadian doctor, that was shot the first day of the protest. Listen to what he says. Both legs shot. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you for being with us. Can you describe what happened to you on Monday? Thank you for having me, Amy. Uh, basically, on Monday, I was doing what I've been trained to do for years. I've been a field medic for quite a while. I'm an emergency physician with a specialization in trauma. I do trauma work in London, Ontario, in Canada, where I spend most of the year. And I also do lots of trauma work here. Uh, I know where to be. I've been around gunfire an awful lot. 
I've been at massacres as well, such as in Egypt previously and a few other places. And I tell you, I was in fact the least experienced person on the team when it came to gunshots. The paramedics were even more experienced than I was, unfortunately. We were away from the protest area, about 25 meters uh, west, 25 meters south of the protesters. We, it was calm. Everybody was sort of loitering. There were no tires on fire. There was no chaos. Uh, it was a very controlled scene. We knew where we were. We could see the sniper posts. For sure, they could see us. And uh, I was just sort of talking to the, the medical team. We were uh, testing out some medical devices that we'd been trying to make in Gaza because of a shortage. And we had, re we had resupplied because we ran out. It was very early in the day, and yet we had run out of our entire supply, so we resupplied. That's when, unfortunately, I heard a loud bang, found myself on the ground, and realized I'd been shot. Not only did this doctor get shot, but the very man that was helping him was a medic, a, a, a Palestinian Gaza resident who was also a medic. His name was Musa. Musa is the Arabic uh, word or the, uh, Greek, excuse me, the Egyptian name for Moses. It's what Moses was actually called in, in the Egyptian language was Musa or Moshe, as we say in Hebrew. He was the one that actually assisted him, got him into a truck and got him out. Oddly enough, though, this medic, who also wearing a vest, clearly marked, identifying what he was doing, was shot in the chest and killed while, help, while helping another wounded individual on the ground. So not everyone was a terrorist that day. And again, I understand when Israel needs to defend itself. But I also realize that a lot of the things that are happening, the unrest, etc., that's happening inside of Israel and also in the West Bank and even the Intifada. The Intifada was orchestrated as an opposition to Israel in order to force Israelis to give up land. Not because of the Palestinians doing it, because of a New World Order agenda. And believe me, there are those that were inside the Israeli government that are fully aware of what was going on and why. And don't think that I do not understand what it's like. Because when you look at my YouTube channel, and if you go to my YouTube channel, I'll pull it up for you and everything, right there on my YouTube channel. You cannot miss it. You know, I myself was in a suicide bombing. I know exactly what it's like to be in a suicide bombing, to know what it's like when this is happening. I lived in Israel during the second intifada. And right here on the main screen, I took the photo myself that day when the young girl that I actually was walking down the sidewalk with, having no idea that she was a suicide bomber. And then the Lord spoke to my heart and says to me, using my own voice, not even knowing why I'm doing, what's going on. Why are you going this way? You know you hate to go this way. I was going to pray in the woods that was nearby my house. I lived close to French Hill at the time, actually across the street from Gershon Solomon. And then I went back. And I was just enough and moved behind a, a wall. And then the, the hill protected me from when she blew herself up. I was not completely off of my feet from the concussion of the blast. So I do know what it's like. I know what my people suffer. By God's grace, I was not wounded in the attack. However, where I would make the phone call because the Lord told me I would make another phone call and I would not leave from that spot. And oddly enough, that pole where I always stood at to make the phone call to the United States was tore up with shrapnel. I would have been a casualty of it. But there's two sides of the story. There are radical Palestinians, but they've been brainwashed by someone in the background pushing them to do violence. Just like the third intifada is done by the sword, the prophecies of Ezekiel said that that would happen. Now the question that I'm asking you is what side will you stand on? Where will you stand yourself? That's what I want to know. Do you stand with Israel? Do you stand with the people of Israel or will you actually stand instead with the Israeli government 
and you're going to side with everything that they do when they have clearly set the stage for Sodom and Egypt. They have made the holy city of Jerusalem a Sodomite city, spiritually speaking because of their actions. They have reset the stage for the Vatican to come in when the Vatican clearly, the Roman entity, Esau's descendants, are also Egyptian and worship everything that is Egyptian you could possibly imagine. Which side will you take? I think this is a time of repentance. And if you in your heart, you feel like that you should not have done this. If you feel like, you know, and I know people that listen to this channel, there are people that are from both sides of the aisle on here. There are people that listen to this channel that are Arabic. There are people that are listen to this channel that are Jews. There are also Christians that listen to this channel. Many of you support the work that I do. You appreciate the honesty that I have. And if you do, then support this channel. Support it. Help us to keep this message alive. You know, you have that opportunity to make that happen. You can give. If you want to give, you can send to our address. We have our address here on the little screen behind me here, Danoon Institute, 8297 Champions Gate Boulevard, number 442. You can support that way, or you can go to our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, and contribute there. But if, if you want to stand for truth, stand for truth. What side, though, will you take? Because the scene has been set in Israel for the very day when the two witnesses will be killed. Now it can truly be spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. I cannot stand for a government that stands for that. And Gulen Fagan was not willing for the Vatican to be able to come there. I don't know if he's changed his stance on that. I have no idea. But at least back then, he wasn't willing to give up Mount Zion to the Vatican. Think about it. So you tell me what side do you stand on? As I said, the evangelical community has actually taken, and the evangelical community has become the blind, leading the blind. Not saying that every evangelical is blind. I'm talking about these evangelical ministers that have gone back to Mother Rome. The daughters have returned to their mother for the last day showdown. But God wants to wake you up. I want to take, I don't normally do this on a news broadcast, but I want to pray with you. If you feel like that you've done wrong yourself, you know, I, I mean, you have to understand, I supported Netanyahu as well. I thought he was a good man of God. And I want to pray for him. Even now, we're going to pray for Prime Minister Netanyahu and for his government. Because Israel has an opportunity for her eyes to come open. Because it does say in Romans 11 that they were blinded for your sake, but their eyes will come open. And maybe Netanyahu's eyes will come open as well. Maybe it won't be too late for him. So we pray for them. We'll pray for them now. And if you want to repent before the Lord that you've been supporting a government that you had no idea was fulfilling biblical prophecy that will actually murder the two witnesses, setting the stage, not to say that the Israelis will do the killing of the two witnesses, but they are setting the stage for them. They have set the scene for Sodom and Egypt. We pray together. And let me say this to my friends that are listening that you're not a believer. If you want to know the, the true Yeshua that has all the things of the word of God that have been prophesied and you see them coming to pass and you don't know Yeshua, Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to pray with you as well. Let's pray together. Our eternal Father God, we love you. We worship you. And this is a very serious hour, Father. Very serious. There's no doubt many good people that have been led astray. And even those that have led the people astray, they've not warned them, Lord, of the wolf that is coming. Jesus even spoke about that in that parable, that the hireling will not warn you that the wolf is coming. And Rome itself is identified by the wolf. It's everywhere in, Vatican, in, the, in the Vatican City there. The wolf is seen everywhere. 
Why? Because the founders of Rome, the legend that they were raised by a wolf, but a shepherd, he comes along and rescues them. Of course, it's the shepherd that put them in sheep's clothing, but he's still a wolf. Heavenly Father, I pray for these people that are listening. I pray for those that don't know your son, Jesus Christ, and I pray that they will accept him as their savior and believe the Lord Jesus. I pray for them even now. I pray for those, Lord, that have been blindly following, thinking that we are standing with Israel, but instead we have been standing with an Israeli government that is setting up a new world order that will not be for the true Israeli people. It will not be for the true Israel that is waiting to see the coming of the Messiah. Forgive us, Father, if we have erred in any way. We want to stand with you and stand with what is true. And we pray, dear God, for these leaders of the Likud party that have taken the people of Israel in the wrong direction. They've given up a land over to the Vatican. They've set up a new world order. God forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. Just like when Jesus was here and they were handing him over to be crucified, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And even today, they don't know. Daniel was told, the robbers of your people will try to set up the vision to marry the vision, to lift it up, but they'll fail. God have mercy on us all. In Jesus' name, Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Friends, I do love you. By the way, too, I, it's a little off subject, but there was someone, my wife said, in the chat room on our live broadcast yesterday said she'd never received the book that we were sending out. Uh, I hadn't been able to make it back to the U.S. And when Yana went back, of course, doing her medical treatment, was unable to see herself either that we had anyone that we had missed. But we know that some people did not because we've heard that there were books, some books returned. Email me, stephenbenoon at gmail.com. Let me know. We do want to take care of this. I may have to do it when I get back because I'd like to send it to you personally, which is about four weeks from now. Uh, but when we get back to the U.S., we'll take care of that as well. Forgive me for that happening. And again, know we love you. We're not here just to be different with people. We love you sincerely. But somewhere we've got to make a stand for truth. Okay? And, I, you know, I could tickle people's ears and I could do like these other hirelings that are out here that are just willing to tell you anything. And I'd probably be a, a, a rich guy because people would just send thousands of dollars. But because I do stand for truth, because I stand like the prophets of old, like Jeremiah, angered the people of Israel so bad they throwed him in the sewers. Isaiah, they sawed him in half with a saw. Elijah had to go run because he was afraid Jezebel would have him killed. When you stand for what's true, you're pretty much hated. So if you do stand with this ministry and want to support it, we need your help. I'm not saying that we don't, but I, can't, I cannot go away from the truth and lie to you and know that i got to stand before God someday and give an account and then ex expect that to just go over well with Him. I want to know I've told you the truth. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. In a world of ain't shalom. Because Jesus said there is no peace until he comes. Fair of time.